Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Gabsky, and I'm the president of the William F. Buckley Jr. Program. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this afternoon's event featuring Professor Barry Strauss. I'd also like to remind everyone, if they can help it, to please avoid walking in front of the camera. Now, before we proceed, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley Program and why this event is so important. The William F. Buckley Jr. Program is the flagship program of the Buckley Institute, an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We've hosted lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, and an annual conference every year since 2011. Our over 550 Buckley Fellows hold a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with, with a form to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley Program has become an institution on Yale's campus and a symbol for a more open and more representative political atmosphere especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website at buckleyinstitute.com. As the inaugural Donald Kagan Memorial Lecture, today's event is a very special one. Over his four decades at Yale, Professor Donald Kagan became more than an educator, more than an administrator, more than a scholar and leader he truly became an institution at Yale. In addition to his many accomplishments, ranging from being a leading scholar of the history of Western civilization to serving as the Dean of Yale College, Professor Kagan was one of the Buckley Institute's founding board members and faculty advisors. We are forever indebted to Professor Kagan for his dedication to the values that make Yale and this country great. And we hope the Donald Kagan Memorial Fund and lecture will spread the knowledge he felt indispensable and help keep his legacy alive at Yale. We're honored to have Professor Kagan's son, Bob Kagan, here with us this afternoon to share a few words and introduce Professor Strauss. Robert Kagan is the Stephen and Barbara Friedman Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution, a contributing columnist at the Washington Post, and the author of numerous books. He served in the State Department from 1984 to 1988 as a member of the policy planning staff, as principal speechwriter for Secretary of State George P. Schultz, and as Deputy for Policy in the Bureau of Inter-American Affairs. He is a graduate of Yale University and Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and holds a doctorate in American history from American University. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Bob Kagan. Well, thank you so much. It's a, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. I, I have to tell you, the reason it's such a great pleasure is that I know that my dad would have been absolutely delighted uh, by, this, by this event, by this, by this series. He would have greeted the news with his usual combination of delight and astonishment. Every time he was ever recognized for anything, he was completely astonished that anybody knew who he was. I, I thought this was false modesty for many years, but I decided ultimately it wasn't. It was one of the things that made, it was made him such a fortunate person in his life. Everything that happened to him was a pleasant surprise. Uh, and so, uh, and this, this would have been one of them. Uh, let me just say one of the reasons that he would have been so happy is that he loved the Buckley Institute. Um, I would say in the last years of his life, uh, it was one of the things about Yale that he loved the most. It was one of the things that kept him in touch with Yale in a way that he might not otherwise have been. And if I had a nickel for every time, he said, those kids, those kids are great. Uh, they really, he, he really, he really loved uh, th what they were doing. Obviously, I th you all know that uh, he put great store in having a diverse set of views on campus, something that is not always uh, easy to accomplish, and he particularly appreciated the degree to which it was undergrads uh, uh, establishing this institution. It was an institution by undergrads, for undergrads, and, and that meant a lot to him. He always, he was always very fond of his undergraduate students. I hate to tell you this, Barry, but his basic view was that his smartest undergrads were smarter than his graduate students uh, because they were not going into academia. <laughs> and so if you, his basic view was, if you're so smart, why are you going into academia? Um, but, but of course, he also loved his graduate students. I have to say, from my perspective, I was 
usually mostly a kid during this period. And my general view of the graduate students was that I basically felt sorry for them because their lives seemed absolutely miserable and my father was constantly worrying about them. You know, it's like having kids. You think that when you get the kids out of the house, you can stop worrying about them, but you never really do stop worrying about them until they're really established. And so uh, I just remember, you know, my dad just constantly being concerned about where these poor people were finding jobs uh, in this vicious, uh, in this vicious uh, game of academia. And in any case, uh, I can tell you uh, without any uh, fear of contradiction that, that Barry was one of uh, my dad's favorite graduate students and he was immensely proud of him uh, for the work that he was doing. Uh, Barry, as you know, writes books that are grounded deeply in the most professional scholarship but which can be read by normal human beings which is a very rare uh, accomplishment for professors these days. Uh, and my dad in particular uh, really, uh, really appreciated that. And so Barry's been a friend for a million years, um, a friend of the family. And as I say, uh, at a certain point, the graduate students became not just their gra his graduate students, but his friends. And Barry uh, was certainly one of those who became his friend. So, I, I, I sh I'm supposed to introduce Barry. He has some incredible, he's a chair that his title goes on forever. He's written dozens of books. He's got a new book, which I'm sure he'll tell you about. He's going to talk about, uh, that's, that's the end of my introduction, Barry. I just want you to know. I memorized it, but now I forgot it all. Um, he's going to talk about Thucydides and, and asking Thucydides how to win wars, I think, which He's going to explain how that's possible since my dad's view was definitely that if the one thing you did not want to ask Thucydides was how to win a war. Uh, with that, uh, let me just say welcome Barry and thank you all very much. Well, thank you, thank you, Bob, for that um, memorable introduction. And uh, I'm really honored, very honored to be here to um, be part of the Buckley Institute and its mission for intellectual diversity on campus. Um, and um, also deeply honored to be giving uh, this lecture, this inaugural uh, Donald Kagan Memorial Lecture. So for those of us who knew and loved Don, a memorial uh, is a bittersweet occasion. But it's also time to think of uh, the many wonderful memories that we have of Don. Uh, Don was a dynamic teacher, an incisive scholar, uh, a generous mentor, a loyal friend, a model family man. But those are adjectives. And Don wasn't really an adjective kind of guy. He was more of a verb person. He was a doer as well as the thinker. So permit me an anecdote or two. Don often said, if you want to judge a restaurant, always order the apple pie. Um, and that's likewise for judging people, projects, or institutions. Uh, he was a man of great humor. One of his uh, colleagues, one of his early colleagues, once said that Don was pure Marx, part Groucho, part Chico, maybe part Harpo, I'm not so sure about that. Um, his lectures were um, immensely uh, informative, immensely analytic, but also immensely entertaining. One could, who could ever forget the hoplite phalanx, uh, the way that he got the people sitting in the front rows to stand up uh, and form a phalanx uh, of an ancient Greek army and show its tendency to march to, the, march to the left as it went on. Would you guys like to do that? No, just kidding. Uh, we're not going to do that today. The seminars were also uh, remarkable. They were student-led, uh, and uh, they allowed us to get to know our fellow students. I actually see uh, a few of my fellow students from those uh, bygone days here today, and thank you so much for coming. It's great to see you, uh, and it's wonderful to remember um, who we were and how we worked as students. Um, Don's seminars were um, great fun. He always had us vote on great issues in ancient history, such as, should, was Socrates guilty? Or should the Athenians have voted to execute the population of a treasonous city? Um, 
Don taught us a lot about strategy, uh, but never more than at football games at the Yale Bowl, where his running commentary on the action was an education in itself. Well, of course, the main thing that Don was working on in those days was Thucydides. He's the author of this great monumental four-volume study of Thucydides and the Peloponnesian War, um, and uh, other books on the subject as well. So anything that I have to say about Thucydides uh, will be a commentary on Don, but I'm glad to hear from you, Bob, that he would have disagreed with the very premise of the talk, because uh, it gives me um, uh, an area for discussion and debate, and Don certainly loved debate. So you probably all know who Thucydides was, uh, but in case you don't, he is the author of the Peloponnesian War, the classic history of a long war in the fifth century BC between the two leading city-states of the Greek world and their allies, between Athens on the one hand and Sparta on the other. And this was a war uh, that was long. It lasted on and off for 27 years, more on that in a moment. And it was devastating. For the Athenians, it led to enormous uh, loss in population and devastation of the economy, ultimately the loss of their walls, the loss of their fleet, the loss of their empire, even to some extent the loss of their identity. I'm not giving you an accurate picture when I talk about the loss. And now let me deal with a paradox, a paradox that Bob alluded to, because Thucydides himself is an odd choice for a talk about how to win a war. Thucydides was one of the great losers of history. He was an Athenian general in his job early in the war. He had one job, and that was to defend the most important colony that Athens had, the city of Amphipolis in northeastern Greece, the gateway to the timber, tar, and pitch needed for the Athenian navy, as well as the gateway to an important gold mine. And he failed. He lost this, and as a result, he went into exile or for the next 20 years. He went into exile after seven years of the war, and he wrote his book in exile. In addition, point two for the prosecution is that Thucydides focuses on the loser of the war. He focuses on Athens. And whether by design or by accident, probably by accident, his book ends seven years before the war ends. So he's not able to give us a detailed account of how Sparta won that war. But trust me, he points to it, um, he points to it earlier on. Well, I haven't dealt with uh, the third argument for the prosecution, which is pretty obvious, and that is Thucydides lived 2,500 years ago. How can he tell us anything about winning a war today? Well, I'm going to call in the expert witnesses who have much, to, have much to offer in defense of Thucydides. I'll call in three of them. The first is uh, US Secretary of State George C. Marshall, uh, who gave a speech in 1947 in which he said, I doubt seriously whether a man can think with full wisdom and deep convictions regarding certain of the basic international issues today who has not at least reviewed in his mind the period of the Peloponnesian War and the fall of Athens. My second witness comes from 1972. This is Vice Admiral Stansfield Turner, who recently had been appointed president of the Naval War College, and he revamped the curriculum in the light of America's frustration in Vietnam. He put a new emphasis on history, beginning with Thucydides. And let me uh, read to you what he says. We will start with Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. What could be more? related to today than a war in which a democratic nation sent an expedition overseas to fight on foreign soil and then found that there was little support for this at home. Or a uh, resulting, well, I think I need my glasses. A resulting structural stress makes a violent clash the rule. Oops, no, that's not it. Uh, excuse me. Uh, or a war in which a sea power was in opposition to a nation that was basically a land power. Are there not lessons still to be learned there? And my third witness is Professor Graham Allison uh, of Harvard, who in 2015 put forward his thesis of the so-called Thucydides trap. He wrote in the context of rising tensions between China and the United States. Thucydides trap refers to the natural inevitable discombobulation that occurs when a rising power 
threatens to displace a ruling power. And when that happens, the resulting structural stress makes a violent class the rule, not the exception. Now, Thucydides himself would have been thrilled to know that he's getting so much attention today, whether we agree with uh, these theses or not, because he said that he wrote his work uh, uh, not uh, as a, an item, an object for the moment, but rather a possession for all time. He said that he wants, his work will be judged useful by anyone who wants an exact knowledge of the past as an aid to understanding the future, which in the course of human things must resemble if it does not reflect it. In the course of human things, the future must resemble the past if it does not reflect the past. Let me make another point in favor of Thucydides, and that is that losers and exiles often have insights that winners lack. My chief example will be Machiavelli, who wrote The Prince not in the comfort of his home in Florence and not in the position of an, in, um, an officer of the Republic that he had served so well, but rather in exile after having been tortured on his farm outside of Florence. It's from there that he wrote his brilliant work. And finally, in many ways, Thucydides' problem is our problem. Thucydides writes about the uh, uh, dilemma of a democracy or the situation of a democracy that faces a long, drawn-out war against an oligarchy, uh, of a, uh, the dilemma of an open society that faces a closed society, of a liberal society that, favors a dis that faces a distinctly illiberal society. And today, in the era of uh, rising tensions and renewed great power conflict, I would uh, maintain that Thucydides still has much to teach us. Well, briefly about the war. So the Peloponnesian War took place between the years 431 BCE and 404. It lasted for 27 years, but it wasn't 27 years of, um, of continuous fighting. It was rather an on and off sort of affair. There were four basic stages. The first stage is a 10 years war, when Athens and Sparta faced off on largely on the Greek mainland. This phase was indecisive. It did not lead to either side winning, and so the two sides make an uneasy peace. The second stage is the uneasy peace. It lasts for six years between 421 and 415. And then the third stage, takes place when Athens tries to break out. It tries to break the stalemate uh, in this war with Sparta by opening a new front in Sicily. It is a complete and utter disaster for Athens. Uh, and the Athenians, having invested, having thrown, rolled the dice and invested a great deal in an expedition in Sicily, they lose everything. Which brings us to the fourth stage of the war, when Sparta, too, opens a new front. This front consists of a new alliance, an alliance with Persia. And with the help of Persia, Sparta is able both to attack the Athenian homeland and to um, tear apart the Athenian empire, the Athenian alliance system in the Aegean Sea. So those are the four stages of the war. And now uh, for the big event, what I promised, how to win a war. So let me offer 10 rules for winning a war that come from Thucydides. Now wars, as you know, are complex phenomena. Victory requires mastery of a variety of different things, including operations, tactics, weapons, logistics, command, and battle. But my focus today will not be on those. It will rather be on strategy, politics, and leadership. These are the areas in which I think Thucydides has the most to teach us. So the first of the 10 items for winning a war uh, that Thucydides offers is resources. In order to win a war, you have to have certain resources. You have to have money. You have to have manpower. You have to have equipment. You have to have infrastructure to support your equipment. Uh, for example, uh, uh, dockyards and shipyards and repair facilities to support the Athenian Navy, and you have to have training. The second thing is allies. There's no state, not even a superpower, that can win a war, certainly not a protracted war, 
without the help of allies. And both Athens and Sparta had a large number of allies. The third thing, and I would say this is one of the big two for Thucydides, is the regime. To win a war, Thucydides would say that if you want to understand where a country, how a country can do in a war, you need to look at the country's regime. You need to understand its politics and its culture. And to win a war, you need to have a country that is well-led, wise, moderate, united, dynamic, wealthy, technologically advanced, martial, flexible, realistic, and when necessary, ruthless. Did Athens or Sparta, did either of them measure up to this very exacting, exacting list of, and exhausting list of criteria? The answer is no, neither of them did. But in a way, it doesn't matter. The issue is less which one is more perfect, but which one is less fallible? Which one can be left standing? Let me talk about Athens first. Athens was a democracy. And as a democracy, it had some of these qualities. It was dynamic, it was wealthy, it was technologically advanced, it was martial, and it was sometimes well-led, wise, and moderate. But it was rarely united and it was often poorly led and unrealistic. Rather than, given the, rather than be led by wisdom, it, was off, it often gave in to emotion and turned, rather than turning on the enemy, Athenians turned on each other. Athens was an example of what the ancients called extreme democracy. And extreme democracy, Thucydides would say, was a bad thing because it gives in to the whims of the masses and puts private agendas ahead of the public good. Still, even in a democracy, Thucydides says, it is possible to be led by a wise and moderate leader. And Thucydides saw that leader in Pericles. He says that under Pericles, Athens was at its height, Athens was well led, Athens had an intelligent strategy, and it was all because Pericles was so powerful and so prestigious. Thucydides concludes that under Pericles, Athens was in name a democracy, but in fact, ruled by the first man. And if that isn't clear enough that Thucydides has no use for extreme democracy, Thucydides has no use for a democracy in which the assembly of the people make all the decisions, he says later on, late in the war, when there's a coup d'etat and Athens uh, is taken over by a regime of men of moderate wealth, men who served in the infantry, men of property, in which Athens became, went from being a society in which there were 30,000 citizens who had political power to one in which there were only 5,000 citizens who had political power. Thucydides says, in no little measure, the Athenians for the first time, at least in my lifetime, appear to have enjoyed good government. Now what about Sparta? Sparta was what the ancients called a mixed regime, but let's call it an oligarchy, not entirely correct, but correct enough. It's a society that has rule by the few. And Sparta was, of course, Spartan. You know, it's not, no accident that if you survey American school sports teams, there are many, many teams called the Spartans. There are almost no teams called the Athenians. <laughs> Athens was famous for its wisdom um, but not for its old-fashioned military virtue. And Sparta was both virtuous and proudly old-fashioned. While Athens was the center of the intellect, while Athens had a fleet which represented the height of technology in the fifth century BC, Sparta barely had a fleet. Spartans fought on land. And Spartans devoted themselves to having the best land army in Greece, a professional land army. Spartans were proud of the fact that they were austere, that they were not very well educated, and that they had only limited contact with the outside world. They felt it could be corrupting to the Spartan way of life to have too much contact with the outside world. Sparta lacked dynamism. It lacked wealth. It lacked technology. It was sometimes unrealistic. It, too, could give in to emotions, and it was sometimes poorly led. But over the long term, it had the advantage in leadership, in wisdom, in moderation, in flexibility, in realism, in unity, 
And last, but by no means least, in ruthlessness. Thucydides gives Sparta very high praise. He says, the people of Sparta are the prime example among people of my acquaintance who knew how to be wise in prosperity and who offered their city, uh, excuse me, who ordered their city the more securely, the greater it became. The Spartan leader praises his country for its wise moderation. He says it was warlike and wise, and it had a sense of order. Well, not to give away the ending, but it's Sparta who wins the war. It's austere, uneducated Sparta that defeats intellectual, technologically advanced, dynamic Athens. How is this possible? The answer is that cunning and common sense can beat Ivy League intellectuality. Let's turn to leadership and see how this played out in fact. Uh, I'll quote Don. Don said that character is often the most important indicator. Character is the most important indicator. And the leaders of these two states at the beginning of the war were rather old-fashioned uh, individuals, Pericles of Athens and a Spartan named Archidamus. They were each calm, argued for moderation, tried to control their society. Archidamus fails. Archidamus thinks that Spartans should not go to war against Athens, but rather they should give in to binding arbitration, that they should ac accept the fact that Sparta could never defeat a society like Athens with its navy and its money and its dynamism and its technology. He fails. The Spartans, in a very emotional decision, decide to fight Athens. Pericles succeeds. He convinces the Athenians to go to war. But he's unable to convince them. Uh, he convinces them to go to war, um, but he only does so by using emotional rhetoric. What made Pericles great? What makes any leader in a democracy great? He knew the proper policy. He had the ability to explain it. He was patriotic. He was a man, above, a man of integrity above uh, corruption or bribery. And to a degree, he had foresight. These were the leaders of the two societies at the beginning of the war, and they're swept away by the conflict. They're replaced by two very different kind of people. And let me say a bit about them. This new Spartan is uh, typified by a man named Brasidas. And Brasidas is courageous. He is a military man. He fights in the forefront. He risks his life. He gets wounded. And he comes up with a cockamamie plan that's so crazy it might even work. That is to take a uh, Spartan equivalent of the dirty dozen uh, grown large, to take a group of several hundred men, none of whom are Spartan citizens. Almost all of them are helots. They belong to the serf class. And to march them over hostile territory in central Greece to northeastern Greece, where he proposed to um, uh, force some of Athens' most important allies to leave the Athenian alliance and join Sparta. As I said, it's a wild scheme, but it's a very low-risk scheme because the Spartans are not putting many resources behind it. They say to Brasidas, give it a try and see what happens. And it works. It's crazy, but it's successful. And ally after ally falls until finally, as I said earlier, this colony, Amphipolis, this most important Athenian colony, falls and costs Thucydides his job and his position as an Athenian. And Brasidas is killed fighting to defend against an Athenian attempt to take back all that he's won. So Brasidas, he's a new kind of Spartan in that he takes chances, but he's an old kind of Spartan in that he is a military man who puts his country first. The new kind of Athenian is very different. He's represented by Alcibiades. Whereas Brasidas was austere, Alcibiades is licentious, luxurious, corrupted by wealth, privilege, and sophistry. And whereas Brasidas puts his country first, Alcibiades often puts himself first. And whereas Brasidas comes up with a plan to open a new front at a very low cost, Alcibiades opens a new front at a huge cost. He sends an enormous percentage of Athens' resources off to Sicily in an attempt to conquer Sicily. Perhaps it would bring the Athenians enough wealth and um, enough manpower that they could defeat the Spartans. And it fails, 
Alcibiades um, is uh, at war with his political opponents at home. They recall him from Sicily, and he decides, rather than going home and facing the music, he decides to turn traitor. He defects to Sparta and pushes the Spartans in the directions of hurting the Athenians. Now, as you might see, guess from this, when it comes to unity, and that's the next factor, unity is the next factor in what it takes to win a war, Sparta is relatively united. Sparta has no room for individualism. Uh, Spartans are all rather cookie cutter. Athens is a society that's proud of being individualistic, but its individualism comes back to haunt it. Athens is a society not just of individualism, but of faction. And as the war goes on, and as the stress on the Athenian people grow, uh, they devolve into factions. They have a coup d'etat. They have a mini civil war. And at the end of the Peloponnesian War, uh, they have a full civil war. So unity is crucial. The next factor is luck. And luck, I would say, is something that you must not count on. Napoleon said he wanted not uh, great generals, but lucky generals. Um, I think he was wrong, actually. But he, he recognized the fact that in war, you can't count on things. You can't calculate things the way you can in peacetime. This is something that it's Clausewitz, of course, who states best. And one of the mistakes that the Athenians made in war was to try to count on calculation, to think that they could uh, have a plan and put the plan into effect, and they didn't have to worry about what would happen. Thucydides has it both ways on this subject. He says that Pericles was a genius, and his plan was brilliant, and that it would have won the war. But in fact, his plan is a complete failure. Pericles' plan uh, is a defensive plan. And now I just must give you just a little bit more detail. One of the reasons why the Peloponnesian War is so intriguing is that it's a war between two different kinds of military systems. It's a war of the greatest land power versus the greatest sea power. It's a war of the elephant versus the whale. And in order to win the war, the elephant has to have, either the elephant has to be able to learn how to swim or the whale has to be able to walk on land. And the two sides, each of them struggle towards this goal. Um, they each struggle toward this goal. Pericles' solution is to say, well, the whale, we, uh, Athens, we're the whale, we have the navy, we can't walk on land, but we can prevent the elephant from lumbering into our backyard. He builds long walls that connect Athens with the sea, which is about three and a half miles away from the city of Athens. And he says, if only the Athenian people come behind these walls, the Spartans will quickly realize they can't really do any real damage to us, and they will come to their senses and make peace again in a year or two. They'll lose interest. They'll get impatient, and we'll have uh, peace. Um, at the same time, the Athenians would go on some little raids or in Spartan territory just to show the flag, to remind the Spartans that they're still there. But it's really going to be a message of how hopeless their strategy is. Sparta can invade Athens, but they can't hurt Athens. This strategy fails. It might have failed even under the best of circumstances, but it fails because they're not the best of circumstances. The a concentration of all these tens of thousands of Athenians, more than 100,000 Athenians behind the walls, leads to an epidemic. The so-called plague, it's a viral epidemic. We're not sure what it was, but it's devastating. Kills perhaps a quarter of the population of Athens. The Athenians sue for peace. The Spartans say, are you kidding? We're having fun. You guys are losing. So uh, it doesn't lead to peace. And I think that Thucydides uh, actually hints that he sees this problem. Uh, so um, having not counting on luck, not overcalculating, knowing that you're limited is very important. Now the next thing, the next factor that Thucydides emphasizes is moderation. He says that in order to have a favorable outcome to a war, you have to know when to stop. You have to know when to cash in your chips. The Spartans could have had peace from Athens when the plague happened, but the Spartans declined. And the Athenians came back and did a great deal of damage to Sparta by opening an attack on the territory where the Spartan serfs were concentrated and encouraging them to revolt. Then the Spartans sued for peace with Athens, but the Athenians turned them down. Neither side knew when to stop. Neither side was moderate. 
The next quality that you need in order to win a war is ruthlessness. You need to know when to be ruthless. And the Spartans had needed no lessons in, in ruthlessness. When the Athenians attack the small Spartan ally of Milos, this beleaguered island, and they demand that the Melians surrender and become Athenian allies, the Melians say, we're not going to do that. We know that our kinsmen, the Spartans, are going to come and save us. And the Athenians say, ha, the Spartans stick their necks out for nobody. And the Athenians were right. The Spartans didn't do that. And then the Spartans do the most ruthless thing of all in the Peloponnesian War. The Sparta, Sparta has a hereditary national enemy. Sparta's entire reputation is built on its heroic resistance against this hereditary national enemy. And yet the Spartans decide, and they decide very early in the war, that the way to win this war is to become an ally of this enemy. And that enemy is Persia. And the Spartans make enormous concessions to get Persian help, which helps them in the end to win the war. It causes them in the end to win the war. The next thing that's needed to win a war is flexibility. And um, as I said, in order to defeat uh, your enemy in this war, the elephant either had to learn how to swim or the whale had to learn how to walk. The Spartans do learn how to swim. They learn how to swim by building a navy, a navy that is funded by Persia. The Athenians had two options if they wanted to learn how to walk on land. They could have built an infantry army like the Spartans. But to do that, they would have had to change their political system and their way of life. And countries don't like to do that. They're not willing to turn themselves upside down in order to win the war. There's one other thing the Athenians could have done. They could have created an elite force to make their army stronger than it was. But they didn't want to do that either, because Athens was a radical democracy. And they didn't want to give the political power um, necessary in order to create such a force. Sparta does what's necessary. Sparta becomes a naval power. This is deeply destabilizing to Sparta and its way of life. And it might have considered what the consequences of this would be. But it was willing to do whatever it took in order to win the war. And the tenth and final thing that I think is necessary to win a war is a lesson that we get from Thucydides, and that is realism. And here I'm going to quote what a Spartan leader says at the beginning of the war. This is old King Archidamus, this old gentleman. In practice, we always base our preparations against an enemy on the assumption that his plans are good. Indeed, it is right to rest our hopes not on a belief in his blunders, but on the soundness of our provisions. In other words, don't make your war plans based on best case scenarios. Always assume worst case scenarios. Always assume your enemy is competent, your enemy knows what he's doing. You have to depend on yourself and coming up with a sound policy. That strikes me as highly realistic. By the end of the war, the Spartans have a different kind of realism. It's a realism that um, can be characterized by a brief quotation from a man named Lysander, the Spartan admiral who wins the war. He says, I cheat boys with dice and I cheat men with sworn statements. This is a realism of a certain kind. It's a realism that's cynicism. So let me re just briefly review these 10 factors. Resources, allies, the regime, leadership, unity, luck or not depending on luck, moderation, ruthlessness, flexibility, and realism. These, I would uh, maintain, are lessons we can take from Thucydides as to what you need to win a war. Um, the character of war changes, but the nature of war does not. Well, I hope I've convinced you that there are lessons in old Thucydides, um, and that Thucydides, as he um, uh, insisted, was, not, was a possession for all time. Let me close with one other statement from Don. My friend and fellow student, Brooke Manville, rem Brooke Manville, reminded me of it recently. And it fits no one better than Don himself. Don said, never underestimate the potential for the individual to change the course of events. Nothing is inevitable, and it ain't over until it's over. Thank you.
Have at me. Excuse me. They're going to give you a microphone. You can't hear me? I'm loud. Oh, I hear you, but they want, yeah, you're on the microphone. So my name is Jimmy Hatch. I'm the oldest undergrad, I think, right now. Uh, I'm in the Eli Whitney program, and I fought in conflicts all over the globe, and I've got bullet holes in me, and I walk funny because of it. I would like to take you to the White House with me so we could talk to the next president the way you just gave this lecture, because I think the Thucydides is right, and I think you communicate it really well, and I'm really, really grateful in this pot of academia that I've become used to, to hear someone like you speak so clearly about it, and I'm, I'm, I'd like to work with you. Peace. Well, thank you. <laughs> Come on, criticisms. We need criticism. If anyone wants to ask a question. Oh. Hi, I'm Cynthia Ferrer, and I graduated from Yale in 1976, and, um, and I was a student of Don's and had the pleasure of being in those seminars with Barry and Brooke Manville and others, uh, even though they were graduate students and I was, I was uh, an undergrad. So I have spent a lot of time with Thucydides, as you know, Barry. And I have all sorts of disagreements with you, but I will only ask two questions right now. One is that I think the portrayal of, um, of the way the Athenians and Pericles interacted as described by Thucydides is seriously incomplete. And because, yes, they, they did not reelect him as general, but then they repented <laughs> and they brought him back. He died of the plague. So it's not that he was around and they failed to recognize that he was uh, the leader they needed at that moment. I would add to that, that if you look at the speeches that Thucydides um, gives us from Pericles, Pericles is not trying to manipulate the Athenians in the most obvious sense. That is, he spends quite a lot of time trying to educate the Athenians about why they are reacting the way they are at the moment when they are disposed to throw down their cards and depose him, right? So he's helping them to understand their own psychological reaction to the rigors of war. Second question, though, is to blame Alcibiades for the Sicilian disaster, I think, is also incomplete. Absolutely, Alcibiades favored this expedition and thought it would enhance his own greatness, which he cared about more than anything. But it was Nicias, the so-called moderate leader at the time, who saw that he was not going to win this argument and thought since he was a general and was going to go out with this expedition, he wanted to make sure he would be safe. So he piled on and he added resources to this expedition to make it completely over the top. If they had not sent out that kind of force, almost certainly they would have been beaten at, in any case but it would not have been as much of a devastating disaster. Well, uh, thank you, Cynthia. Let me just try to draw up th those really great points, and it reminds me of how wonderful it was to be in seminar together in, in, in the old days. Um, but um, your comment about Pericles, I think, is really great, and it's a reminder that uh, when a nation's at war, it has to have a leader who can communicate to the nation and to do so repeatedly what the war is all about, what the aims of the war are, and why the nation has to stay the course even when times are difficult. We think of Churchill or FDR as paradigms of this. Um, secondly, uh, the Sicilian expedition, sure, it wasn't only Alcibiades' fault, and in some ways it was Nicias's fault even more so. But I think the Athenians really had a chance of uh, winning in Sicily if they had followed Lamachus' strategy 
of taking a relatively small fleet and sailing right into Syracuse Harbor and engaging in shock and awe. And if that failed, to go home. In that sense, I think they needed to be more like Brasidas and Sparta, to be ruthless, to realistic, ruthless and realistic and not invest so much in something that was far away and had a real chance of failing. That, I think, was, was their big mistake. So I, I think the lesson there is that uh, a nation has to be quite thoughtful in what, uh, in what it calculates um, for any particular expedition or particular mission. Thank you. Uh, my name is Aaron Shore. I'm a senior in Yale College. Um, I really appreciated your analysis of the differences in the kind of Athenian and Spartan regimes that determined the course of the war. Right. One variable I didn't hear you mention was ideology, if you could even call it that. Um, I think just kind of trying to apply these lessons to the present day, you know, if we look, for example, at the Russia-Ukraine war, we see ideology is a super important variable in determining uh, the motivation of people to, individual people to go fight. Um, so I'm wondering if there's anything you could share from this Thucydides story that might you know, give additional context um, for some present day. Uh, well, I think it's a really great question. I think there's a difference in that um, the Spartans, um, both sides in the Peloponnesian War were really highly motivated and they really believed in their ways of life. Uh, in their respective ways of life. Uh, the Spartans weren't going out there cynically thinking, we don't believe in Sparta, but if we don't fight for Sparta, we'll be shot, or something like that, well, uh, speared. Uh, they, they were really quite serious uh, about uh, their, their regime and what it stood for. Likewise, the Athenians sincerely believed in democracy and the democratic way of life. So there was, abs I think that, one difference between that and the Ukraine-Russian conflict is I think that both sides were very sincere in what they believed in, and ideology motivated both of them. I think the Spartans maybe found it easier than the Athenians to be cynical um, and, and to be absolutely brutal. Uh, they were more arrogant than the Athenians. That does not serve them well in the long term. But in the short term, it's easier for the Spartans to say, cut our losses in Milos, make a deal with our hereditary enemy Persia, no problem. Because after all, we're Sparta and we must be right. How that fits into current day, I'm not so sure. But I think that's one difference between the two sides and ideology. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Dr. Strauss, are there are the three major reasons countries go to war power, property, and ideology? Well, Thucydides, I mean, those pr three are the three major reasons why countries go to war, power, property, and ideology. Um, I guess I would put it somewhat differently, and here I think Thucydides does have something to teach us. He says that the three things that motivate states are security, it could also be translated as fear, but he uses two different words for fear. One means more like panic, this means more like security. Security, honor, and profit. And I think that one of the lessons from Thucydides is we shouldn't underestimate the degree uh, to which states are motivated by fear fears for their security. Um, and as for honor, well, we don't talk that much about honor in today's world. Um, I think we need to. But we certainly talk about prestige, and we certainly talk about credibility. And states then and now will go to war for prestige and credibility, uh, more easily if they have other interests involved as well. But I don't, I don't think we should underestimate those. One of the things that is so good about Thucydides, one of the things we can take away from him, and again, I think this is really valuable in Clausewitz, in Machiavelli as well, is the importance of emotions, the importance of the passions when it comes to war. Um, we should not leave those out of the picture. You're welcome. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Troy, class of 1981. I had Don several times. Uh, you just mentioned uh, in the answer before about the Spartans were more arrogant 
you said, than the Athenians. And, you know, it's been a long time since I've read this stuff, but what I remember is the Melian dialogue. I thought what it was conveying was the extreme hubris of the Athenians. And as I recall, when the Melian dialogue ends, the Sicilian expedition begins, and the, yes. there's a clear suggestion that one leads to the other, and that's why they lost. And the quote at the end, you quote Lysander. I don't, I don't know what happens after the war ends, but right. I would say Sparta's going nowhere good if he's right. talking that way. Because right. that sounded like the Melian dialogue. Yeah, so that great point. Um, I guess I think the difference is this. Early on in the war, the Athenians suppressed the revolt of the island of Lesbos. The city of Mytilene uh, is the leading city. And this is a total betrayal of Athens. They stabbed Athens in the back. They were Athenian allies who plotted against Athens. It's a difficult revolt to put down. Um, and the Athenians first decide in their righteous anger to execute every man and enslave the women and children. They repent of it. And the next day, they have a debate. And Thucydides gives us two speakers, the leading hawk and the leading dove. And the Athenians decide, we can't do this. It's too terrible. We'll only execute the ringleaders. True, the ringleaders turn out to be 1,000 men, um, but it's different than executing, say, 10,000 men. At around the same time, the Spartans put down the city of Plataea. Plataea had not revolted against anyone. It was an Athenian ally. And Sparta's ally Thebes attacked Plataea in the beginning of the war. And it's a long and difficult fight, but eventually the Spartans defeat the Plataeans. Uh, the Spartans round up every Plataean who's left and they have a tribunal, and they say to, they ask the tribute Plataeans a simple question. What have you done for Sparta lately? Uh, and the answer is nothing, and they execute them. And so I think the difference is that already at the beginning of the war, Sparta's there. And already at the beginning of the war, Sparta's sending an embassy to Persia. Um, the Persians aren't interested. They, 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 they need some uh, credible commitment on the part of the Spartans. I think Thucydides' point is it takes the Athenians a while to get there, but they reach the same place. They became as bad as the Spartans. But in the beginning of the war, they're more noble. They're not that arrogant. So thanks for a good question. Next question. Oh, next I'm uh, Skip Warden. I'm class of 97. Yeah. And uh, I remember Kagan, but I never took his class. Um, I, as you were going through the criteria, with Sparta, I kept thinking of Nazi Germany, especially when you talked about ruthlessness. And I thought, well, Sparta won, Nazi Germany lost. And I'm thinking, maybe simplistically, that maybe in terms of uh, Hitler violated uh, moderation when he opened up a front, an eastern front and a western front, would you agree that that's where, where he failed and Sparta succeeded? Uh, certainly, Hitler was not moderate for the. Uh, uh, to, you know, um, it, it hurt the Russian people, but it, in, in the end, it, it, it helped the world by defeating Nazism. I wouldn't want to compare Sparta simply to Nazi Germany. I think one of the other differences is that many people in Greece admired Sparta. They thought the Spartans stood for ideals that mattered to them. Um, the Spartans uh, really were public-spirited, and they were courageous, and they did sacrifice themselves uh, for their country. So. Um, a bit different than the Nazis, and the Spartans didn't go around crushing everyone who they conquered, although I gave you this example in Plataea. Uh, but in other places, the Spartans made deals with the locals. So I think they had the advantage of offering more uh, to the people they conquered or to their potential allies uh, than, than the Nazis ever did. Yeah, absolutely. And the Ukrainians, for that matter. There was a question down here. There's a question here in the front row. Thank you so much for your talk. You're welcome. Um, so you mentioned that the Athenians would not sacrifice their way of life to win the war, while the Spartans would. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that, oh, please? Sorry. Can you hear me? Is that yeah, better? Yeah, no, I okay. can. Um, so you mentioned that the Athenians would not sacrifice their way of life to win the war, while the Spartans would. Yeah. However, I credited Sparta's cultural emphasis on war preparation with their winning the Peloponnesian War. So my question is, to what extent is a state of war for a state necessarily different from the normal state routines? And is it possible for a state to exist as Sparta thought that they were, to exist prepared for a war? 
And were the changes that Sparta went through a reaction to changes during the war? I'm so sorry that I just couldn't, and I, 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 this problem okay. with the mic, I couldn't really understand it. Like, what's, maybe just the core of the question, please? Okay, so to what extent is the state of war for a state different from the normal state routines, and to what yeah. effect did Sparta Gr achieve this? Great question. So a uh, question is, to what extent is the state of war different from the normal uh, state of affairs for a state? So uh, Britain in World War I, am I right, Bob? They passed the Defense of the Realm Act. Um, is it in World War I? Uh, the Brits pass an act in World War I, and then another one in World War II to basically say, we're suspending normal uh, rights and procedures for the duration. You know, we're, we're, we're going to suspend these privileges of, of Englishmen of Britons for the duration of the war. So that, that's an example of a state that does um, put things away for the duration. In effect, the United States did that in World War II. Uh, and also in World War I, I don't remember the name of the law, but the US passed a kind of sedition act, uh, which allowed the government to round people up who were opposed to the war. Sometimes successful states do things like that. And one of the arguments against the Athenians is that they didn't know how to reign in their democracy. Uh, for, in order to uh, advance the military effort. So that was, it was business as usual. It was uh, zany at times with different people coming out with their opinions. There was no central organization, organizing principle behind the war. And the Spartans didn't have that problem because they didn't have a democracy. It was easier for them to be centralized. The downside, of course, is that they weren't open uh, to other opinions as much as the Athenians were, and they certainly didn't have the technology. But they knew how to zero in on things uh, in a way that the Athenians had trouble doing. So yes, I think an important lesson for democracies is that sometimes you do have to give up business as usual uh, for the greater good of winning the war so that you can survive and thrive as a democracy. Thank you. Excuse me, I would challenge Mr. Hatch as the oldest undergrad. <laughs> okay. um, I did 20 years in the military and the Army and Department of Defense, and uh -huh. um, I, have, I served in Afghanistan. It's very near and dear to my heart. So um, the way we pulled out of Afghanistan, to me, I attribute our constant rotation of leadership in positions, decision-making positions, as well as our regime, regime changes in our own country. And I was curious what you thought about or what you thought the advice that the Thucydides, I have a hard time saying that name, um, gives us, what can we take away and apply today that, that actually applies? Um, and if you have any advice about what you think the most important lessons are for tomorrow's future leaders that are sitting in this room, um, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Sorry, sure. I'm nervous. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Thank you for your service. Um, I think that uh, Yes, democracies do have a disadvantage in that they have change of regimes. We have a change of regime every four years, and sometimes less based on congressional elections. But one of the reasons why the United States did so well during the Cold War was that there were some basic bipartisan principles that both parties agreed on. Uh, one of the difficulties today is the oscillation uh, between uh, extremes that we, we get in elections. Uh, that may be inevitable in a democracy, but it also allows someone like Putin to think that he just has to wait us out, wait until the Americans lose patience, lose interest, uh, and go on to something else, or the election is changed. So yes, uh, it, is, it is a difficulty. And again, I think that leadership can play a really major role in convincing a population that a certain policy uh, or a certain war is more important than any political advantage to be gained. And you really need to educate people. I think one of the problems we have in the United States today, and this goes to your other question, is what do the leaders of tomorrow need to learn? I think they need to learn that education is crucial. Um, and you know, the educational system in the United States changed in many ways um, from when I was a kid. Um, uh, and some of them were, for good, were good, it became more diverse, it became more open, that's all to the good, it's terrific, it was necessary. But it lost, it threw the baby out with the bathwater, and it lost some of the basic principles. So I think we need to go back to basics. We need to go back to reading the classics. We need to go back to studying history. Um, and we also need to educate people in patriotism, in 
intelligent in thoughtful in questioning patriotism but we need to make that part of our education as well and we need to make severity as part of our education as well it's a big big job and I think that's uh, one of the things that people need to take away for the future you're welcome I think we have time for one more question. If there's any one more question. Yeah, there was one back there. Back there. Hi, thanks for your talk. I am a first year PhD in classics here at Yale. Great. And just a softball here. So taking all your framework and trying to apply it to ancient Rome and why their machinery of war was so successful, if you could please expand a little bit. Why the Romans were so successful at war? Uh, yeah, well, that is a great question. It's a long story. Let me try to make it short. Um, the Romans had a society. It was kind of thuggish. Um, it became a very uh, intelligent thugs and thugs who served nobler purposes. But the way to get ahead in Rome uh, was to lead an armed band of warriors and to win conquests. Maybe this was necessary because Rome, unlike Greek city-states, did not grow up in isolation. It was surrounded by enemies of different nationalities. So the Romans had to survive. Uh, the Romans grew up in the school of hard knocks, and they also, um, they also prized military prowess and conquest as the way to political power and the way to honor. Um, and they were very good also at compromising. Uh, it was a political system in which different people, uh, different parties, the ordinary people, uh, the nobles, uh, the wealthy, they all argued with each other and fought with each other, but they, the Romans were exceptionally good at coming up with compromises. It has something to do with their social system, uh, which is a social system that's quite much more hierarchical than the Greeks. One difference between the Romans and the Athenians can be summed up as follows. When the Athenians met in the assembly, they had wooden benches on a hillside and everybody sat down and they raised their hand. They started the assembly. The herald said, who wants to speak? I want to speak. I want to speak. I want to speak. Everybody got up and said their piece. In Rome, when the assemblies met, no one was allowed to sit down because the Romans thought it was a bad idea to encourage people to speak. You don't want to do this. Uh, you want to have consensus. Get it over with and, and move on. It's not a democracy, but it's very effective. And it, it is a republic. It is a constitutional system, um, and it's one that, incur that in engenders a certain kind of unity. So I hope that's a good short answer to a, a long question. Well, with that, I hope you all join me in thanking Professor Strauss for being with us this afternoon.